You're listening to Superpower Curiosity with Dr. Richard Gillette. And I'm Molly Ruth, producer for the podcast. In season one of Superpower Curiosity, we're exploring how to overcome divisiveness and why we feel so much better when we do. To read all about this, make sure to check out Richard's book, It's a Freaking Mess. How to Thrive in Divisive Times. On the show today, we have our last Curiosity Room episode of the season, featuring a discussion between Richard and a very special guest. Here's Richard. Thanks, Molly. Yes, today I'm delighted to be talking with Dr. Marjorie Woolacott, who is the Emeritus Professor of Human Physiology at the University of Oregon. Marjorie is the author of the multiple award-winning book, Infinite Awareness. Such a great title and a fascinating book. I have read every word. Marjorie has also written over 180 peer-reviewed research articles. Wow, that is a lot of papers. Marjorie has a unique perspective. She has been a neuroscience professor for more than three decades, and she has been a meditator for almost four decades. This combination of approaches forms the background to her book, Infinite Awareness, in which she so cleverly intertwines the observational methods of science with her own profound experiences in meditation. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. So, Please pour yourself a cup of kindness and take a seat with us in the Curiosity Room. Marjorie, welcome to the Curiosity Room. It's great to be here, Richard. Well, Marjorie, how should we start? You have both practiced and studied the art of meditation. Maybe I can add the science of meditation as well as the art of meditation. So how would you describe the essence of meditation? Well, it's an interesting question. I think that the way I look at it is that when I come to meditation, my mind tends to be somewhat cluttered with a lot of thoughts and emotions about what is going on right now, what just happened, what I'm about to do today, and what happens in my meditation, the essence of it is turning down the background noise of my brain and my narrative framework about the world and being in a place of stillness where I am in a place of deep contentment at the same time, somehow stillness and deep contentment and being present all seem to be part of this experience of meditation. So I'm hearing that you, you, you're you going below the noise of all the thoughts about what's going on in the world, what's going on in your life, all the thoughts and noise about what's happened in the past, all the thoughts and noise about what might happen in the future. And you're going to a place of far greater peacefulness and contentment. Is that fair? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking that uh, meditation in a way starts as an act of mind. I mean, one decides to meditate, that's an act of mind. And initially one does things to quieten the mind. So it starts mentally and yet its effects involve so much more than the mind. I'm thinking of physical effects and emotional effects and spiritual effects. So I, I'd like to start with the, the mental effects. I read in your book, a great book. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so in your book, it, you talk about how meditation improves one's attention, one's ability to focus intently. I, I'd love to hear more about that. Well, yes, I think in the book, when I began to do this research on really understanding what is, um, what are some of the byproducts in a certain sense of meditation, I was surprised to look at the research, especially of um, a man named Matthew Killingsworth, who was actually looking at um, 
when we're happy and what are the circumstances around which we're happy. And I was very surprised to see that he had done this study where he gave an app out to people where it would randomly ask them, are you happy or are you not happy? And yeah. then are you what are you doing and are you focusing on it or are you focusing on something else? And he said that 50% of the time people were not happy. And in that same 50% of the time, they were not focusing on what they were doing. They, their attention had wandered to something else. And right. I thought it was fascinating to me in that it tells me right there that attention is critically important for happiness. And of course, the bottom line is that the people who are doing research on meditation are showing that in fact, meditation allows you to improve your attention so that you can stay focused on what you're doing in the present moment. And therefore, Da da, you would be happier much, much more of the time. That's great. That's that's a, a pretty wonderful side effect to to be happier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I also remember reading that there were some experiments done. Yes, I got this from your book as well. Yeah, there was some experiments done on um, how meditation actually improved your ability to focus. There were, there were various tests done on your your ability just to focus on on computer tasks or games and so on. Yes, and that's something that I did with a graduate student of mine um, in my laboratory. And I want to just start out saying that she had practiced Tai Chi in the past, and she loved Tai Chi. Right. And so yeah. she said, I want to see whether Tai Chi can actually be better than, for example, aerobic walking exercise, which people have shown helps your focus. You get more blood to the brain and you're now able yeah. to bend better. Yeah. And she yeah, said, yeah. I think Tai Chi could be better. And I said, I want to actually add in meditation because I think meditation, like Tai Chi, also improves your ability to focus and, and keep that still present mind. And so we did a very interesting study where we had people come into the laboratory and we, first of all, put an EEG cap over their head so that we could yep. measure all the activity of their brain. And then we put them in front of a computer to do a computer game. And in the computer game, they had to respond to this light going back and forth across the screen and tap as quickly as they could when the light was, for example, on a particular side of the screen, according to ever-changing rules. So they had to right. stay absolutely focused. And if they made a mistake, then they got a lower score. And what we okay. found is that the meditators, in fact, and the Tai Chi practitioners were much better at the task than the sedentary adults in our study and the aerobic walkers were halfway in between. But more interesting to me is that when we recorded the activity in the brain, we found that this something called the event-related potential, which is how much you're focusing on a task at the moment a stimulus comes on, was about twice as big in our Tai Chi practitioners and our meditators than the sedentary adults. And again, the aerobic walkers were in between. So it says we have a much stronger ability to actually stay in the present moment and respond on very quickly to what is correct according to whatever is going on around us in terms of the rules that we need to follow in the present moment to make something the best possible outcome. It makes so much sense to me. I, I, I'm a Tai Chi practitioner myself and I love it. I'm also a meditator myself and I also love that. And I'm just thinking as you're, as you're hearing you speak about this, that when we meditate, we focus intently on something it could be the breath or the mantra or a physical sensation etc uh and when we're doing tai chi when i'm doing tai chi i'm also um hopefully uh intently focused on the movement and the the inner feeling of the movement so i'm guessing that in doing those activities we are practicing how to focus absolutely yeah and and so uh, what advantage do you see in people's lives if they improve their ability to focus? Wow. I mean, to me, that is actually one of the most important skills that we can learn. And I'm going to actually take a step back to say that some studies were done on yeah. a particular part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex that is very important in our executive attention system at keeping us focused. And what they found is that you can actually look at four and five-year-olds and you can yes. measure the size of their um, anterior cingulate cortex. And they found that, first of all, the size of the anterior cingulate, it gets larger the more you meditate. And right. there was a direct correlation between the size of the cortex and their later success in life um, measured, for example, by their health, their um, level of criminality, meaning that they are now um, very, very um, 
quiet, appropriate people in different situations rather than being violent and things like that. And also their um, success in careers, other things of that sort. And so it tells us that this is going to be important to us in really almost every aspect of our life. The more we can stay focused in the present, the more we can keep from distractions, the more effective we are in any career we decide to choose and whatever we're doing. Yes, uh, it makes total sense. And, and I'm also thinking, wow, it's, <laughs> it sounds so simple and it's so important. I'm also thinking that in school, I don't know about you, but I certainly wasn't taught how to focus. That's an interesting <laughs> point. I think you're right that it's not something that was traditionally taught in school. And yet now I'm told by my friends that actually practice mindfulness, that there are programs now actually bringing it in even to the elementary yeah. schools and showing how much is helping the children and when they can really begin to understand this. It's wonderful to listen and hear about those studies. Well, that's great to hear. And actually just recently, I, I was approached by somebody to ask if I would teach something about mindfulness in a school. So, uh, yeah, I think this is. A, I think it's awesome that this is happening. Yes, it's, it's really great. Okay, well, we talked a bit about the the mental effects. I mean, I, you know, we're touching the surface here, but but uh, this is very cool. Um, and so let's move on to the some of the physical effects now. Um, the physical effects of meditation. Any thoughts come to mind on 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 that? Right. I mean, and when I think about physical effects, I first want to say there are broad physical effects. For example, a lot of research has shown that you can decrease the risk of cardiovascular disease, for example. You can also yeah. improve your immune function to get rid of yeah. um, diseases. But I want to focus more on changes in the brain specifically. And here right. what we find is that I, uh, there's a wonderful study by Sarah Lazar at Harvard University Medical School, where I think she mentions that the way she got into this research was that she actually had a leg injury due to some um, athletic event, um, maybe a running injury, and she went to right. do Hatha yoga. And she was told by the Hatha yoga teacher that this yoga was going to improve prove her compassion. And she thought, oh, come on, I'm a scientist. I can't believe that's really true. Maybe a placebo, but that's all. But then when she took right. the class, it changed her. And she got so curious, she decided to go back to the laboratory and compare meditators to non-meditators using, right. um, again, brain scans. And what she found yeah. was that the older meditators had brain thickness in critical areas of the prefrontal cortex related to executive um, attention, for example, and other parts of the brain, whereas the the non-meditators had a thinning of the cortex as they got older. So she said, right there, your mental capacity stays strong until you get older. But then she did a second study where she said, well, some people said, well, that's just because meditators are weird. What about actually training <laughs> people? And so she trained now um, people who had never meditated before for eight weeks. And what she showed is that the meditators increased the thickness of specific parts of their brain, including the hippocampus, which is for memory, and also the temporal parietal junction, which is an area related to compassion and responding appropriately in a certain context. And then finally, also the amygdala, which is the source of our reactive emotions got smaller. And right there, we're saying, wow, this is not just something in the moment. This is a permanent change that allows us to change our habits of how about how we actually relate to the world in any given moment. It becomes a very strong, permanent effect as long as we continue doing it. <laughs> So, uh, Marjorie, this is this is incredibly inspiring. Uh, I, I I read about this in your book, and I, I I was like, wow, this is so awesome. And the reason I'm saying that is that it's just so wonderful to know that we can actually change the shape and physical structure of our brain through changing our habits or changing what we do and how we think. Yes, and and. I often hear, and I, I, I'm sure you do too, especially as a, as a neuroscientist, that uh, the, the opposite idea, which is that brain structure determines what we think and who we are and, and how we are. And that to me is a little depressing. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so it, it's just, it's very nice to hear that, that how brain structure actually changes with how, what we do. Absolutely. I, I, yes. Yeah. I, it's a, they say that, I mean, at any age, we can change the brain um, through meditation. And of course, they're showing 
give it to kids. That will actually help them, their brains become stronger, adults, and then even older adults. So there's never a time that you can't use that brain plasticity to improve your attention and your goodwill toward others. Your um, All of the great um, virtues that we have in the world seem to be related to that quiet mind allowing us to feel connected to other people around us and to our planet in general. Right, right. So in 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 meditating in, in meditating and uh, or meditational practices like Tai Chi, I presume as well. Yeah, we get to a place where we can go uh, within. What does that mean? Beyond, as we talked about, right? You talked about right at the beginning. Beyond the the noise of the thinking about past and future, and other people and relationships and so on, um, to a quieter place where qualities like compassion naturally abound. Exactly. So, right. Yeah. Yes. And maybe I'm just going to take a moment to say something about that, because in the last five years, I've been very curious about why we have such difficulty in our normal day-to-day -day lives actually staying um, in that place of present moment awareness, for example. And what I learned is that there is this particular part of the brain called this default mode network. And it yes. is a network that is our mind wandering network. It's what's going on all day long as our ego is um, telling us stories about who we are and how we relate to the world. The point is that that default mode network acts as a filter to keep us from experiencing what's truly happening all around us, from being able to truly listen to the people that are, tr are talking to us in a given moment. And what they've found out is that when one meditates, the default mode network, network significantly turns down, and there is a direct correlation between turning down the noise, the activity in that uh, mind-wandering, um, egoic narrowed, ner network, and the ability to experience more expansive states where you feel unity awareness with the people around you. And therefore you feel more compassion for the people around you because you see that you and they are are really at essence one. And so it's this beautiful understanding that you can see it happening right there in your brain. It's like, if I can just keep that turned down, my sense of joy also expands because I feel everything is fine because I'm one with the people and the situation around me. And then I can act totally appropriately um, with the right understanding about how things should be done for everybody. Thank you. Let, let me ask you a question about the default mode network. Yes. The fact that it's called a network, does that imply that it, it exists in several different parts of the brain? Absolutely. And I just want to mention that there are two parts that are most critical. One is the medial prefrontal cortex right at the very center of the front of your brain. Mm -hmm. And the other is the posterior cingulate cortex a little bit toward the back. And those two are the ones that are most active in our normal day-to-day -day thinking. And those are the ones that turn down the most when we meditate. But you're right, it's, it's in very right. parts of the brain. So these, these, those two areas you mentioned are particularly important areas in, in the default mode network. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. And the default mode network sounds very similar to the ancient concept of ego. I, I, when I say ancient, I'm, I'm talking about the, the, uh, also the concept of ego as people understand it, that, that yes. when we get caught in ego, we get caught in how we're doing and thinking about what other people think about us, uh, we get caught in a, a place where it's harder to feel our joy and our compassion because we're caught in comparisons and so on. Yes. How, how, how would you say the default mode network relates to ego in your opinion? Well, I think it is actually the source of our ego. It's the narrative that we create from the time we're children about how who we are and how we relate to the world. And I think there's something interesting about that network as well. And I'm going to add in a technical term, but it's called the thalamocortical loop. And this this loop in our brain, this between our cortex and the default mode network and the midbrain, which is the thalamus. And that is always going on throughout our day um, with our narratives about, I wish it were this way, it's too bad, it's not that way, et cetera. And what we find is that that loop they call a potentially closed loop, meaning that that can keep you from attending to what's going on around you. And I think we all right. know this. It's like you're walking down the street and you haven't even noticed who's gone by because you were in that cortical, thalamocortical loop. And what it means is that you have 
let go of all the beautiful sensory input that's coming in around you to tell you what's important to be attending to in this moment. So what we're trying to do is close that one down a bit so that we can actually hear better what's really happening around us. So you can't see the beauty around you because you're caught in this loop of thinking yes. about the past or the, or, the, or the future or somebody else or something that somebody did or, or something that somebody said and so on. And so we're, then we're missing out on, on so much joy in our lives. And something that I think is interesting to say about that is there's a man, Roger Walsh is his name, a psychologist who actually said that he's a long-term meditator. And when he would come out of a deep meditation, he said, it was as if the signal to noise ratio in my brain had shifted so that now everything seemed brighter around me. Um, luminosity yes. seemed much more beautiful. And it was like, because now I could see and hear in ways I couldn't see and hear before. Yes, well, that is my experience too. Um... And I'm guessing it's yours. You, you, you can tell. But my experience too is is that after meditation, uh, things seem brighter and more present. Yes. Is that your experience too? Absolutely. I mean, and I should say that it also nicely seems to spread out throughout my day then because I'll come out of meditation and the heart just feels like it's open now and there's a sense of sweet contentment and love and then that pervades the rest of my day and when a challenge comes up I can come back more quickly to that place of loving presence even though I might have been thrown off momentarily by the particular situation I can come back and say ah yes this is where I want to be and then move forward from there yeah uh, that also is my experience. And, uh, and to put it uh, the other way, I find that if I miss a morning meditation, which doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does, uh, I notice the effect throughout the day uh, yeah. that I'm more likely to get distracted by thoughts or things that happen around me in this world. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and I'm more likely to lose it in the, in the sense of, uh, losing my my composure and and good feeling. Yes. So yeah, I, I'm I'm very with you on that one. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, we've been talking about uh, the physical effects, and uh, let's move on to the emotional effects. What would you say are the, are the uh, any thoughts you have about yeah, the emotional it. effects of medicine? And here's another thing that I learned from doing research in the area, and that is that meditation has powerful effects on our emotions. And I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, okay. One is that um, there was a beautiful study done by a man named Paul Condon and his colleagues at Harvard University and Northeastern University. And they wanted to know whether meditation actually can improve your compassion. And they did a right. study where what they did is they gave people an eight week meditation training and they did yep. mindfulness meditation and also compassion meditation, wondering if there would be a difference. And then they fooled the participants by saying at the end, we're now gonna um, have you come in and fill out a questionnaire for us. But what really happened is that they had actors in a waiting room of their lab. And in the waiting room, there were three chairs two chairs were filled and one chair was there for them. So they sit down in the chair and then a person comes in on crutches in pain and they wanna see how many people will give up their chair for that person coming in on crutches when the other people are sitting there not doing a thing. And what they found was that when they compared the meditators to the waitlisted controls, 55% of the meditators got up and left their chair for the other person and only 15, one five percent of the controls did it. And they said that is a large increase in compassion wow. across this group from eight weeks of meditation training. So there is that sense of, I feel the compassion of the other person. The other thing I think is interesting is that when I was, <clears throat> was yes. reading something that Richie Davidson, a, a long-term researcher in meditation said about this. He said, what it appears to be is that people who meditate are not just put into distress by suffering and then feel they can't do anything. Suffering actually causes them to want to alleviate that suffering in others and step up to do something about it. It's like they're empowered by their meditation to alleviate suffering. And I thought that's a beautiful example of the power of meditation. So what I'm hearing is, is it, it not only does it produce a, a feeling of compassion, 
it also creates the action of kindness. Exactly. It's correlated with the action of kindness. Yes. And can I add one more study? Yes. There's one other that was done now in a hospice setting. This is now yes. in Bonn, Germany. And now they're saying, what happens if we train the caregivers in meditation? And yes. so they trained the caregivers. And what they found there, I thought was so interesting, is that the caregivers noted now that when they got into those situations in a hospice care setting where people are going into some sort of an emergency state or something, they used to like get into just this downward vortex of, oh my goodness, what I'm going to do. And they said now they could stop, take the moment, center, feel the compassion, and then out of that compassion, act appropriately in that moment for everything to work out as best possible. And they said also, even when they were away from work, they would often be filled with anxiety about what might be going on at the hospital. Now they could simply go into that place of compassion and stay with what they're doing on their day off, but feeling compassion for all the people without the worry. I thought that was so beautiful, that shift in their state. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Let's uh, look at the other side. I I'm thinking of, of anger and fear and, and the reduction in anger and fear. Yes. And I, I was reading, it really interesting what you were saying about how the amygdala reduces in size, whereas the, uh, I think it was the, was the anterior cingulate cortex increases in size. Exactly, right. At, in, in with, with meditation. Yes. And I believe that with uh, if you get caught in anger or fear, the exact opposite occurs. Yes. That the amygdala increases in, in size and, and the, the parts of the prefrontal cortex actually decrease in size. Yes. Which is uh, both scary and amazing and um, uh, makes it feel, to, it feels to me, this is even more important that we are able to do something about our fear or our, or our anger so that we can actually um, uh, maintain the best health of our brains that we can. Absolutely. And I want to just say something more about that research you just quoted, and that is that when you meditate, because you are increasing the power and the activity and the size of your prefrontal cortex, your executive attention system, what it does yes. is it sends inhibitory inputs back to your amygdala and your emotional center. So it allows when you have that moment where you want to react out of like some sort of emotion to do something instantly, the prefrontal cortex that's now stronger inhibits that reaction so that you can pause, take a moment, reassess, and then do something from the place of rationality and compassion that would not have happened if you hadn't been able to hit that pause button due to your executive system. Right, right. Wow. Well, I, I, this is uh, very interesting to me because in, in the podcast, I've been talking a lot about fear and anger and people's reactions to what's happening socially and politically, so much divisiveness. And, and when there's a lot of divisiveness around, it's uh, very easy for us, and I'm certainly including myself here, to get caught in, in an angry reaction or a fearful reaction, uh, anger about what someone, uh, what the other side might have done or has done, or fear about what they might catastrophically do. Um, and... I'm wondering your thoughts about how one can use meditation to uh, reduce those effects so we don't get hurt and discomforted so much by the divisiveness that may be happening around us. Yeah. So here are two things that, that I do, in fact, relatively often in my own life when that happens. One is I simply, in fact, take my hands and often I'll put them over my heart and I will find a place of total compassion for, in a certain sense, the four or the five-year-old in me that is really reacting to the situation and is really suffering. And I simply hold my own self in compassion that this is bothering me so much. And as I hold right. my own self in compassion, I feel the contraction letting go and I feel myself beginning to expand and begin to feel that's okay. And I wanna add one more thing about that. There's a wonderful um, psychologist who's no longer living now now, David Hawkins, that talked about the fact that every time an external event triggers anger or sadness or all of fear, those sorts of things inside of us, it's actually not creating that fear, but it's opening up the reservoir of those past memories that we have emotionally inside of us. And he suggests that 
When we feel, for example, sadness or anger, or whatever, we simply rest with it for a while and try to just be with it with compassion again to see if we can let it dissipate. And he says that for him, when he would do that, and sometimes it would take a long time for it to begin to dissipate, he began to lower the reservoir of those past reactive feelings inside of him so that he could come from a more neutral place, whatever was happening. And so that's another exercise I do. I just hold that feeling and try to compassionately let that dissipate inside of me. Yeah. It, it, what you're saying reminds me of a, an ancient uh, exercise. Uh, this comes from the Indian scriptures of, uh, I expect you might be familiar with it. And it, it, it when we have an angry thought, um, or we're feeling anger, to focus on the physical sensation of that anger. Maybe it's a a feeling of tension in our forearms, or maybe it's a feeling in the heart or a feeling in the, of heat in the belly. I mean, it, it can take many different forms. And we focus on, on that. And then in focusing on that, uh, first of all, it takes us, that takes us right into here and now. We're no longer concerned with the story of what we're angry about. We are feeling the physical reverberation of that anger in our body. And then the next step, which I, I think that I love this step, which is that uh, to take that feeling, we've already distanced it, separated it from what we assumed was the cause. And as you're saying, the, the cause is much deeper than that. It's within ourselves. And, and then we take that energy and experience it just as energy and then feel that energy moving through our whole body. And uh, it, I think it's an amazing exercise. Yes, I totally agree with you. And I think they are coming exactly from that same source of understanding that um, yes. the fact that it, I, I blame it on the external events, but it's coming from inside my body, my own reaction. And so I can do something about that. It's a wonderful understanding. Yes. Well, that, that brings, brings me to uh, another question, which is we've talked something about some some mental and physical and, and emotional uh, changes and benefits from meditation. What about uh, spiritual effects like finding the peacefulness in which to connect to one's spiritual longing, uh, no matter which path you're on, uh, just finding that place of peacefulness where you can connect to your deeper self, let's put it that way. Uh, any comments on that? Well, yes, I, I think that's an interesting point that you make. And I should say that when I was a young neuroscientist, I had an unrecognized longing for something bigger in my life, but I didn't know what it was. And once I began to meditate, I discovered um, that I could contact what that was that I was longing for, which was this place of love and joy and peace in the heart. Um, by my meditation. And then as we talked about earlier, bringing it out into my day. So I think that what's happened since I started meditating is that I now see the world differently in that my highest goal is to be in that place of unity awareness with the people around me, with my planet earth um, and caring about others and myself, and then letting that play out in my career and the research I do and other things like that, but it's become the heart of what I do. So in other words, it's like the, the spirituality of it that, and when I say spirituality, I'm really meaning that sense of just this incredible joy and sense of connection with everyone around me. And that even though things don't appear to be perfect in the moment, it's all moving in a direction that's gonna be helpful in the long run. And when I have that trust and faith that seems to have come through meditation, I now find joy in most of the moments of my life. And if I am thrown off balance, I can get back there a little bit faster than I could before. <laughs> Right, right. Well, th that reminds me of something we've already talked about uh, in this conversation, which is uh, the, how meditation connects you to, let's say, your elevated qualities, to use that term. Um, I'm thinking of uh, qualities like contentment, compassion, which you've talked about, uh, curiosity, courage, kindness, joy, love. Um, I was very interested in, in the experiments you mentioned about how meditation increases compassion and kindness. And any thoughts about uh, 
curiosity and courage and joy and well yes i think in fact when i think about the word um curiosity to me that's one of the most important things that we can have in life and i say this because i was a materialist neuroscientist for many years um believing basically that the mind um really was created only by the brain when um, the brain is really controlling everything in my life. And when I began right. to meditate, I began to feel, wait a minute, there's also an element of the mind and my consciousness affecting my brain and my brain is plastic and I can do something about it. And suddenly right. then I realized that I didn't know that when I was a materialist neuroscientist because I wasn't curious about looking at the research that shows that's the case. And so one of the things right. that I'm learning about yes. curiosity is like, if we have a particular point of view, if we can just be curious about the opposite point of view, we might expand to understanding how the two views aren't necessarily black and white, that there is a sort of a, an area that sometimes I like to call um, we talk about a force and an antagonistic force, and then sort of a third force that's an umbrella that brings the two together and helps us see the connections yep. between the two. And that's what my curiosity allows me to do by looking at the point of view that's opposite to my own with curiosity instead of with, no, that can't be true. And do you think that your meditation practice has increased your curiosity? I imagine you're going to say yes to this, but <laughs> if, so, if, so, if so, how? <laughs> absolutely. I mean, absolutely. The way it has is that, first of all, I, I am now curious about research that I never even would have looked at before, because I now see that there are multiple views on the world. And it has allowed me to try to hold, certainly, this is a paradox of here is material reality and the science that I study that is very, very powerful, looking at things from what I call the third person perspective. But I've yeah. never seen that I used to ignore the first person perspective, the subjective experience of myself and others. And what I'm trying to do now is hold those two perspectives in balance and saying it's not that one is necessarily better than the other, but I need both in order to truly yeah. see the world in its true nature. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, well, I, I, in that little, little list of uh, qualities that I mentioned, we've actually, we've talked about uh, uh, compassion and curiosity and Kindness, uh, joy. You have mentioned how uh, how when you meditate, you feel much more joyful. Um, and what about courage? Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> and you're reminding me that there is some yeah. statement, and I won't get it right, but it's something like it, we measure courage by the fact that in the face of fear we are willing to go forward with a particular um, action. And it's not yes. that you are without fear and you do it, but it's the fact that in the face of fear, you still think it's important for you to move forward. And I think that's my own understanding that um, some people think, well, um, look, you're giving a talk, you, you don't have any fear of speaking, things like that, but they forget that many of us do have a fear of speaking, but we want so much to share that we're willing to step through the fear and go into situations like that right. and overcome. Yeah. So I think that that's the key issue about um, courage. I just love the fact that we accept fear and then we move forward. So did meditation help with that? Absolutely. I mean, I can think of so many ways and I should say that it's partly that I, um, what's the word I want to use? It's like th the open heartedness and the joy seem to trump the fear in most cases, the incredible open heartedness and joy. It's like, oh yes, I want to talk about that because that's more yeah. important than any fear I might feel. Yeah. So how then do we do this? So to be more specific, uh, what is your practice? Do you practice, do you meditate every day? I think you do from what you've said. Uh, do you have a particular time when you meditate? Right. What, what are you? Yes, and I, I want to mention um, here two things. First of all, I meditate every morning 
I'm an early riser, have always been. So I get up like at five o'clock in the morning, every morning, and I actually do some Hatha yoga because I like this opening and stretching and energizing the body before the meditation. Mm -hmm. Then I meditate. I typically meditate for about 45 minutes or an hour, something like that. And here's the reason I meditate at least 45 minutes. My mind takes about that long to quiet down. And if I only do it 20 minutes, the narrative network <laughs> is still filtering out the stillness because of my narrative. So there's right. reason for going longer. Then the other thing I do, and this is something you even mentioned in your book as well, is at the end of my day, I used to find that I would have insomnia at night because I kept on my computer until the moment I went to bed, sometimes with yeah. articles or whatever. But now instead, I stop a good hour or two hours early. I read something calming, and then I will do something like chanting and meditate for that last hour of the night, because then I move into sleep in this beautiful, peaceful state, and then I don't have the insomnia. So it's to me, that's a key issue that you had mentioned in your book too. It's like, don't listen to the news and do those things for those last two hours, or you will have insomnia or have bad dreams. <laughs> this way you right. have beautiful dreams and you're at a state of peace and then well, well rested the next day. Yeah. I, I'm just thinking that uh, e even if you uh, don't have insomnia and don't have bad dreams, even then, if you listen to... Uh, upsetting news before you go to bed, you still carry a certain amount of tension, which, which affects your depths of sleep. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so one last question for you, Marjorie, which is a more personal question. Uh, and you may have, I think you have actually answered this in several ways, but uh, let me ask it anyway. Um, can you say one thing, it can be big or small, uh, that has changed for you personally as a result of your lifelong study and a practice of meditation. And I, I know you could mention a lot of things because you've already mentioned a lot of things, but just just choosing one for now, what is, is the one overall thing that you could say, well, this changed for me because I meditated? Well, the humor is that what truly has been life transforming is that finally toward the end of my career, when I could admit to others now that I was a full professor that I meditated and do research on meditation, <laughs> that truly transformed my life because now I could spend my day, um, even now after I've retired, studying meditation, doing research on meditation and learning about it both from that first person perspective that I'd had for um, 35 years, but now also the yeah. third person perspective. And that brings me great joy, putting those two halves of my life together. So now I spend all day reading about it, doing research on it, and then talking about it with others. And so I'm full of joy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Marjorie. I, I, that, that's great to hear. And it, it also gives me joy to, to, to speak to you and to, to hear both sides of the story, so to speak. I love hearing the connection between meditation and the brain. And I think that's so helpful because uh, so many of us, and uh, I, I know you know this so well, but it's, it's, it's quite common to, to separate them and um, to think of meditation as, as something that is just beyond the physical and sometimes a strange thing to do, although not so much these days. And so to get that connection to, and to recognize that uh, meditation actually changes us uh, physically, including brain structure, and mentally, uh, and emotionally, and spiritually, uh, certainly in, in terms of the higher qualities that we, that give us joy and, and that are a pleasure to have and that connect us to other people. So it's wonderful to hear that from you. And I, I thank you very much for, for talking with me today. Thank you, Richard. It was a pleasure, obviously. I love to discuss this with my friends. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. So glad you could join us in the Curiosity Tea Room on this episode of Superpower Curiosity with Dr. Richard Gillette, featuring Marjorie Wallacott. If you ever have a question or comment for Richard, send in a voice memo or email to superpowercuriosity at gmail.com. 
just three more episodes to go. As we draw to the end of Season 1, please consider sharing a favorite episode with a friend. And stay tuned to this feed. Episode 22, Choose Your Thoughts, Choose Your Feelings, drops in two weeks. Till next time, stay curious!